All right. Hello, LinkedIn and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us live today. We have a great topic to discuss, and it's all about breaking into data science. And it's actually a double topic because we're also going to talk about sports analytics. The special guest today is Ken G. He's an awesome data scientist, YouTuber. You'll learn all about him when I bring him onto the stage. For now, as you're joining the session, just let me know uh, which sports you like to watch. And we're going to talk about how all that relates to data science and sports analytics. So I'm not going to make you wait any longer. I'm going to go ahead and bring Ken G up on stage. Hello, Ken. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This is such an awesome uh, opportunity. You know, we've had so much uh, fun talking in the past and I'm excited to bring everyone watching into some of the rabbit holes we can go down. Awesome. I can't wait to go down the rabbit holes. Um, before we jump into rabbit holes, let's go ahead and start with a quick bio, Ken. Why don't you tell everybody who you are, what do you do? Perfect. So my name is Ken G. I'm the head of data science at a company called Scouts Consulting Group. So at Scouts, we help athletes and teams improve their performance by analyzing the data that's collected on them. So we're focusing mainly on sports outcomes. The field of sports analytics is quite a lot bigger than that, and I'll definitely talk about that uh, a little bit later. But again, our main focus is helping people basically win more or make more money. Um, okay. I'm probably better known on LinkedIn and some of these communities for my YouTube content. So on YouTube, I make videos about how to break into the data science field, a little bit about what the data science lifestyle is like, what it's like working in data science. I also do interviews with people like yourself. Ours is coming out in a couple of weeks here and some tutorial and some of my own project content out there. So hopefully if you're looking to learn data science, if you're looking to break into this field, I have some good resources for you available there. Awesome. Um, and I don't know if you mentioned it, but what's the name of the YouTube channel so people can go check that out? So yeah, you can just type my name in, Ken G, G with a J. Um, and uh, I should be the first one to pop up. Hopefully. You were. I think when I looked for you, you were the first one. So I'm just taking a look. So we've got a bunch of people joining. We've got Steve from New York. That's actually my brother. So hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. <laughs> um, we've got John Singh, snowboarding and NFL. We've got Scott with golf. Paloma, uh, basketball and soccer. So my brother loves the American Ninja Warriors. Not sure if you can call that a sport per se, but I guess let's accept hey, that. We, we can break ground, be the first to do analytics on it. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. Uh, Carlos from Argentina. Uh, Kayla likes basketball, football, soccer. Let's see, more comments coming in. And yes, just like Moneyball. Yes, I just brought that in, Sofria, something like Moneyball. Um, all right, so I think we're good to go ahead and get started, right? So let's go ahead and start with the topic of breaking into data science. And maybe let's start with the topic of how would one go about learning what is, what is data science and what it, all of that entails? Uh, what would be some of the first steps a person who is not a data scientist can take to break into data science? So I think one of the hardest things about data science is that the field is so broad. I mean, you have to understand a lot of elements of programming and of math and of creating business value. And that's something that if you're looking at it from the outside, you know, looking in, it can be extremely, extremely overwhelming because there's just so, so much to learn. I think that if you really wanna have success learning this field, you really have to narrow the scope and break data science down into different chunks. Mm -hmm. So the first chunk is usually, what I think people should learn first is programming. I think that you should get a little bit familiar with Python. And then I think the math concepts are also important, but I personally believe you, you can learn those a little bit later. After you've got some foundation in programming, I think you should start turning your focus towards problem solving and getting started with projects. So when you work on a project, you only have to know the tools or, or the, the, the know-how to solve the specific problem that you're working on. And that makes data science from the super broad thing into this fairly concrete and finite thing of understanding the problem you're working through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the same thing with when you're, you're doing your math homework and you look at the theorem, and then you have, if you apply it to a, a little test question, yeah. you start to understand the inner workings of it. You start to get that way better grasp of it. And 
that's how I would approach data science is start applying these things. You don't have to have complete knowledge of them to start applying. You barely have to have any knowledge of them. You have to have uh, something you're really interested in. And I found that when people on the internet are uh, very interested in a topic, they can do some pretty incredible stuff. And uh, everyone here, everyone trying to learn uh, data science is, is absolutely no different. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So start with some programming, do some Python, and jump into problem solving. Do you do you have a place where people can go to maybe get sample data sets to play with or any other platforms where they can go and actually start problem solving? Absolutely. So the best platform out there that is free right now is Kaggle.com. Uh, I've also started this 66 Days of Data Initiative, which is really starting to get at this uh, problem solving or, or solving the where to start approach. So the idea is that every day you just take five minutes or, or more. So five minutes is the minimum threshold and you work on a little bit of data science. Hopefully it is project based and you mm -hmm. do that every day for 66 days. And so I chose 66 days because 66 days, according to some people is the average amount of time it takes to adopt a new habit. Mm -hmm. And learning data science isn't about just like, hey, I'm gonna learn this all in, in four days and I'm not gonna sleep. It's about creating good maintainable habits for tackling this gigantic field over time, chunking just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Um, and the other part of that is doing projects and sharing your work. So along with those 66 days, the only other requirement is that you tweet it out, you write in the Discord about what you're working on, you put it on LinkedIn, what you're working on. Mm -hmm. And that starts to help, um, one, hold you accountable because other people are seeing it. And two, it gets you used to sharing, which is gonna be really important for getting a job, which we're gonna talk about uh, a, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Which which day are you on currently? When did you start this? My 17th day. So you can start any day. Uh, th there's, you know, if, if you're a little behind me, that's perfectly fine. This is an initiative that I'm hoping will go on forever. You know, I mm -hmm. will probably do another 66 days sometime after I finish my first 66 days. Uh, because uh, honestly, I am really liking the, the habits it's creating in me. There will, there used to be some days where I wouldn't write any code or I'd stop working on a project and I'd go back and you have to take, you know, an hour to relearn all of the stuff that you were working on, get pretty familiar with some of those things. So, um, uh, this has been a little selfishly uh, good for me to keep my own accountability and yeah. I'm so happy I can share this also with other people and, and get them involved and get them excited about learning data science like I am. Yeah, that's awesome. I absolutely believe that it's effective because in January 1st this year, I started something called hashtag daily coding, where basically pick any language uh, for me with both R and Python. I really just wanted to learn enough to know, I don't know how to make a chart or something, something simple in both R and Python. But then it led me to so many different paths because every day I would be like, okay, all you have to do is read something about coding, actually code something, and then share your work, just like you just mentioned. Yeah. Share you can your also work. Watch a, a YouTube video, one of our videos, or something like that. Watch a LinkedIn Live. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Watch, watch a out. LinkedIn Live. There you go. That's more than five minutes for sure. But you definitely, I learned so much through that process. And I will be fully transparent. It was about June or July when I stopped my daily coding. And it wasn't because I couldn't form that habit, it was because I shifted my focus to data visualization just went full force into that space but there are so many people still on linkedin that if you look at the hashtag daily coding i think that it was over ten thousand followers of that hashtag it really picked up fast because people were like oh i want to do daily coding and you start where you are that's your day one and you don't even have to put numbers on it it basically goes on forever for as long as you need it to um so i really love that and i wanted to ask you you mentioned discord is that part of like a group that people can get into to do the 66 day challenge? Yeah, so I can, the, the link is shared on the YouTube video where I announced the 66 data, days of data on my YouTube. Mm -hmm. I also wrote a Medium article about it. Uh, right now we have, I think we just passed the 2000 people threshold in that Discord server. So there's, I wouldn't say everyone's participating, but a lot yeah. of people are sharing what they're working on every day. And it's a great place to just say, hey, I'm struggling with this problem or I'd like to learn this, what resources are out there? Yeah. I've been. I've honestly been so, so impressed with the initiative people have had um, with helping each other out because, you know, 2000 people with messages all the time and between all the other stuff I'm doing, I, I personally can't stay completely on top of it all the time. Uh, and everyone has been unbelievable. Honestly, I, 
it, it makes me so excited about all of the data science communities, the ones on LinkedIn, the ones on YouTube, whatever that might be. Yeah. Because it seems like a very like, happy and open place where, where we can share and help each other improve. Truly, truly is. And I'm seeing a lot of those familiar faces here that have joined. So we've got Scott Taylor, the data whisperer. I think I saw Susan Walsh on here. Yep. And there was a question from Carlos about what was the website again? Um, I think that was, is maybe they're asking about the Kaggle question because this came in a few minutes ago. Yeah, it's Kaggle.com. And then um, I'm working on getting a 66 days of data website up. I have bought the domain and uh, my friend Andrew Mao from his Data Leap YouTube channel is helping me build out the website. And also Sanyam, who does a Chai Time data science podcast, which is also yeah. pretty cool to, to check out. So I always try to, to plug my friends a little bit if I'm <laughs> looking for new resources. Yeah, that's always good. Uh, we've got Ashley here saying that 66 days of data has been so helpful for creating healthy habits, for staying in touch daily with data science and being held accountable in an incredibly passionate community. So. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. You're knocking it. Ashley's very active in the community. Uh, she's been, been been very vocal, sharing her goals and helping other people. So, I mean, it, if it was filled with everyone, you know, with the same initiative as her, uh, I would say data science would, would take over the world. So, <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Trouble, but it, it'd probably be a good thing. I, don't know. I think I was, the more you put into something like this, the more you get out truly, because if you, you know, participate every single day and you're actively engaging, you just, you can learn so much more and build a, you know, great relationship with other people. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the best part of any of the content that, yeah. that I'm creating is the ability to engage with a lot of people, you know, both who are just at the beginning stages and, and experts on the other side that, that know so much more than I do. And, uh, <laughs> The fun part is I get to bring those people together and and hopefully act as a medium that can do some translation because the experts don't always uh, speak on the same same wavelengths as as uh, as myself and some of the beginners. So <laughs> yeah, uh, we got Al saying uh, he can't wait for the sixty six days of uh, data site. He's been grinding away and enjoying your YouTube videos. So people are exactly. waiting and get to work, man. I know. I know. Again, I have the domain. I'm having a little issue with AWS right now. So the domain takes like a minute to get. You're saying you got the domain. Yeah, you just bought a domain. So we have the domain. We have the website built. I just have to connect the domain to the website. Oh, OK. Yeah, that, that's what it should be ready by tomorrow, guys. Ken, Ken is ready. So um, before I take more questions, I just want to remind those who have joined us live, feel free to put your comments and questions in the LinkedIn or YouTube chat area, and we'll try to address as many as we can. Uh, we've got one here from uh, Naveen saying, hey, Kate and Ken, I want to know how to break the mathematics behind data science and machine learning, how to see the life within the data through math. So I, I think math is the underlying backbone of all data science. It helps us understand the problems, mm -hmm. but it at a certain point is abstracted away. We, I, you, can, you can do all the data science algorithms, you can do all of the analysis, without really having any of the theoretical understanding of math. Mm -hmm. Where math is important is when you're trying to understand how to create a new solution, or you're trying to understand uh, how to tune a model, or you're trying to understand how to um, Im improve efficiency, some of these different things. And so my advice is almost always learn programming, learn to apply things, and then go back and learn the math. Because if you have an applied understanding of the algorithms, you know, uh, what results you're getting with a decision tree versus a logistic regression. You at least have some framework to work off. You know what goes in, you know what comes out. Yeah. And if you have that understanding, you can go back and hopefully understand the math with a little bit more context. So that's kind of that, again, project-based approach uh, to yeah. learning. You know, most people don't necessarily think of, of math as a project-based approach learning field, uh, but it can be treated that way. Yeah, I think that's a great approach because I think it's also a barrier for to entry for the potential data scientists where they're like, okay, I need to start at the math level. And then the math doesn't really make as much sense because you don't have that contextual um, information around why decision trees, logistic regression and all that stuff. But once you've done projects or watched projects, reviewed things, then it makes more sense. And then I agree. Then you go back to the math part and then it should hopefully make sense. Well, if it'll make him feel better, I think in college I got a D in calculus, 
when I first took it. Okay. And then, when you first took it, you have to take it again? I did, yes. Um, but I've, I've much grown since then. And I think <laughs> I'm pretty good at uh, a lot of the calculus concepts. But one of the things that really made that hit home is when I was working with gradient descent and I had to understand how that worked. I mean, that is based on some form of derivatives. But mm -hmm. um, when I had something to apply it to, and I saw the end goal of like, okay, gradient descent is gonna make my neural network work. Um, I have to learn this to be able to, to do this in the future. Right. That made sense to me. And I was able to understand it pretty easily. So who knows, <laughs> you'd experiment and see what works for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got another question here on the 66 days of data. Is there a certain time limit? And if not, can anyone join at any time? You can join at any time. If you use the hashtag or and you tag me on Twitter, I will almost always I'll almost always read it and like it. Um, mm -hmm. I will be doing it. Uh, you know, I started 17 days ago. I'll, after I finish uh, the 66 days, I'll probably take a month or so off, and then I'm thinking about doing a, another round. So there's. Okay. There's no time. There's people who started yesterday. There's people who actually started before I did when I had announced it initially. So, uh, yeah, uh, my, my best advice is to start whenever you can and hopefully mm -hmm. have a bias towards action and do it today. Yeah. Because just that makes sense. And um, how do people join that Discord group that you were talking about? So, I did post on LinkedIn. I can also uh, comment on the post related to this. It's also mm -hmm. linked in on the YouTube channel. Um, the, the video that's at the top of my channel is called Why I'm Starting Data Science Over Again. And I have all the details of 66 days of data associated with that video. OK, awesome. So we've got a comment here from someone on YouTube. Um, he's a huge sports fan just starting out on the data science journey. Can you please give some advice on breaking specifically into sports analytics, which leads us perfectly into our next topic, sports analytics. Perfect. Perfect. So yes, I can in fact do that. So I hate to tell you, but breaking into sports analytics is not that different than breaking <laughs> into data science. So there are really two, two very important things in my mind for breaking into any of these fields. Oh, three. So the first is to think about breaking into these fields analytically. Think about them like you're a data scientist. I don't see many people, um, really approaching these like true problems, like what would give me the best chance to get a job? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think that just applying and using shotgun tactics, applying to a thousand positions is gonna get them a job. That it's is a numbers game, no? Is it not a numbers game, Ken? So it is a numbers game, but at the same time, there are levers that you can pull that yeah. will re require maybe slightly more effort in, in one space, uh, but less effort in applying a lot. So. For example, if I'm going through an employee referral, my mm -hmm. odds skyrocket compared to going through a resume drop. Like that does take a little bit more time for me, but that's also an opportunity cost um, of the time that I'm spent that I've spent just sending out resumes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you're thinking about that, what are the things that you can do that would give yourself the best chance? So the first is um, looking at what skills are important. So if I were to apply now, I would find 20 jobs that I'm very interested in getting. And I'd look at all of the skills that, that, that are required on those jobs. So it'll probably say Python, it'll probably say some other tools. But if you're thinking about what should I learn, what tools are gonna be most important for this field I wanna break into, mm -hmm. that's the best way. You do some data collection and you do some analysis. You could visualize it very beautifully. Uh, you can ask Kate for help on that. Uh, but you can see like, you know, 90% of these jobs are asking for Python and experience with, uh, you know, SKLearn or Scikit-Learn, whatever, uh, Scikit-Learn, sorry. Um, I think it's Scikit-Learn. I it's never know how to pronounce it correctly. correctly. Yeah, I, I always read things differently in my head for some reason, yeah. but, uh, but regardless, I mean, if you're thinking about it that way, it's like, yeah, you know, one of the most common questions, what, what skills should I learn? Do I have to learn all of these tools that, that are listed on these, on the job postings? And it's like, no, just learn the most important ones and be familiar with the ones that you see semi-frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing that you can do is create a track record. So if anyone reaches out to me as, you know, asking for help, uh, if they're looking for a new position, whatever that might be, I always Google them. I look at what they've done, right? Mm -hmm. If you've shown that you've done quite a lot, whether that's hard work or whether that's something that is very relevant to me. So as uh, in, in sports, if you've done three projects on 
different sports outcomes. Let's say you're trying to get a job in basketball and you've done three different projects, one predicting outcomes, two talking about clustering different players, and three, you're applying for a position on my team, let's say I'm the, you know, the, the Lakers, and you've done an analysis that's targeted specifically at how my team can improve our play, we can you know, improve our, oster, our roster optimization, uh, we can improve our defense, whatever that might be. That to me is very compelling. You're, you're telling me a story that you're already doing this work, you're excited about it, mm -hmm. bringing you on, you're gonna already create immediate value because I've seen the value in what you've done before. So question here, let's say you are Googling somebody, where would you see these projects? Is it medium articles, YouTube videos, LinkedIn posts? What form would you prefer to see these projects or where would you expect to find them? So I don't think that there is a preferred form, but I will say, um, I, I think GitHub is portal on the new resume. And I, I am, I, I won't throw a resume in the trash if I don't see a GitHub on it, but I'm a little bit surprised when I don't uh, these days. Um, so I recommend GitHub. I think Tableau Public's very good. Kaggle profiles are very good. Uh, mm -hmm. A personal portfolio website is something that is becoming more more common, and I highly recommend doing one of those. I have a couple yeah. videos on how you can do one of those in like 10, 15 minutes. Um, and uh, sharing Twitter, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone does a cool project in my network, I almost always share it. Mm -hmm. um, if I see it, so if you want me to see it, you can always tag me in it and mm -hmm. uh, the chances go up. Uh, but, you know, things like that, it's, it's not necessarily on one platform. What's important is you're sharing it and you're creating this network effect. Mm -hmm. So even if I do something uh, on YouTube, a lot of the times I'll share it on Twitter, I'll share it on LinkedIn, uh, I'll share it in these different places because that maximizes the reach and maximizes the probability that someone sees it in general. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And, it looks like Al asked the same question that I was just saying. If you put together a project with a write-up, is there a best place to publish? Maybe we should create a company. Yeah. Whoever's then. listening, create a company, datasciencejects.com, so people can have a portfolio of projects. I mean, I guess GitHub is doing that, right? I, 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 yeah, I had someone who was, who was working on that. I have to, I'll, I'll put him in contact. Um, okay. The guy's name. But so, so when you're doing that, what, yeah. what people, usually don't realize is you're using the power of gravity and that sounds really weird right it's like how's gravity related to this what's gravity got to do with it man right so when we're building a network when we're uh putting projects out there we're creating this body of work that's growing and growing and growing and when things get to a certain size they start to have a gravitational pull so you know we, we look at the sun the earth the moon all these things have stuff that begins to attract things to them so the mm -hmm. more work I do, the higher chance it is that someone sees it yeah. and the higher chance they actually reach out to me. And anyone in sales, anyone in business will tell you that opportunities are, that are coming to you are way easier to close than when you go out oh, and, yeah. and reach for opportunities. Absolutely. And so, I mean, that takes time, but once you start having that kind of attractive force by putting all of that content out there, you'll be really surprised at what, what comes your way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you might think the best opportunities are, are the ones that you go out and get, but there are a couple opportunities that have come my way that I wouldn't have even been privy to. I wouldn't even have thought of. And uh, they ended up working out a lot better than the ones that that I you know, thought I wanted. So, you know, it, it also is very nice to feel like you're wanted. Uh, <laughs> of course, everybody wants to be job, wanted. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so, so the last thing uh, that I think can really help with, again, a data science or sports analytics job is just networking, reaching out, getting employee referrals. I've talked to, on my YouTube channel, probably between 20 and 50 different data scientists, between my YouTube channel and my, uh, and my course, How to Start a Career in Data Science. And I, I've talked with you know, around 50 different people. And there's only been one of them that got their job through the traditional resume drop. These are all very well-established data scientists, very, very sharp. And they've either gone through employee referrals or they've gone through a recruiter. Mm -hmm. And you know, data science, sports analytics, no different. You want to be referred. You want to find someone that is uh, 
that is in the company that you want to work at already, because that'll create that attractive force on their end. I mean, if, if I'm working in a company, I already work there and I say, I want my friend to work here, you know, it, it looks a little bit bad if they don't at least give that person a shot. You want to, I would hope that yeah. companies want to keep their employees happy, <laughs> right? Yeah. So Plus they think that if he's recommending, then he's basically putting his name behind this person, that other person must be good because you wouldn't ruin your own reputation internally by bringing in somebody who's not good. So exactly. it definitely makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never gotten a job by applying to a job. I always tell this story because I've had several jobs in my, in my lifetime so far. I've never got one just by sitting and clicking apply, apply, apply. I know people do it and I know people get jobs. I know very few people who actually have gotten jobs that way. Um, yeah, it just never, I, and the jobs I ended up getting were it was not something I would even apply for because it had like 10 years of experience when at that time I had one. Yeah. Right? So it actually happened through content, putting content out there. Yeah, I mean, and it's crazy, it's crazy how that works. I, I, I wouldn't quote me on this, but some I'm writing this down. Quote you. Quote Ken G said. I've seen were that almost eighty percent of jobs come through non-traditional means. So that's not the direct apply process. Yeah, it's uh, already becoming the traditional means is already you can't even call it traditional because nobody's doing it anymore. Yeah, I, I guess so. If, if less than half is doing it, I guess it is. It is not traditional. Yes. So, we yeah, actually I mean, have a question here relevant to the topic is how do you get employee referrals when you're just starting out and you don't have any experience? So I love that question. Thank you for asking it. Um, that actually leads me right into, you know, how to create these relationships, something that I think is really important. And that's being active on these platforms. You know, if mm -hmm. I see someone that comments on a bunch of my posts, if I see someone that is in the circles that I'm in, if I see someone that is sharing a lot in my network, I'm a lot more likely to answer a message I get from them. I'm a lot more likely to potentially do them a favor and introduce them to my network if I, what I'm seeing that they're sharing is really yeah. good. And so, you know, it's all about creating that familiarity. If someone reaches out to me and I've never seen them on LinkedIn before, I've never had any interaction with them, uh, and they're like, Ken, can you con connect me to this person? I really want a job at this place. I don't know this person, you know, like how can I, you know, that's my reputation if I'm connecting them. But, you know, if I've seen you, if we've interacted a lot, if you, if you've shared my stuff or whatever that might be, yeah, okay, you know, this person has at least been a part of my story to this point, you know, they're listening, they're, they're, they're working hard. I'll at least entertain the idea. I'll have a conversation with them. I'll maybe try and help them out if I can. I mean, I would love, you know, my goal is to help as many people get, uh, data science, analytics, sports analytics jobs as possible. But at the same time, I want to make sure that my, my time isn't wasted. I want to make sure these people are putting in the the necessary time, the necessary work, those types of things. And so yeah. there's, it, I mean, it, on the it internet. Is, <laughs> it's this human nature concept of, I always liken it to pushing a car. Like, let's say your car breaks down, you come out of your car and you're pushing it, right? Or two people are pushing it. Other people watching you are a lot more likely to come out of their car and help you push your car if they see you struggling and doing it um, versus if you are just sitting with your feet up on the steering wheel saying, help, yeah. help my car, my car. And people would be like, well, screw you. You're not doing it. Why am I going to even help you? So I didn't even I think it's just psychological. We're hardwired to help to want to help those who look like they're really trying they're to help themselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, it doesn't really fit with the analogy that well, but one thing that I think, well, I've clearly harped on that I really think helps with um, with breaking that barrier is having good projects that are interesting to people. Mm -hmm. So if someone reached out to me and said, Ken, you know, I did this project, I think it would be valuable to you or your company. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, you know, I wouldn't, there's some, you have to be delicate with this. Like, I'm not going to sit and read a 20 page paper. Yeah, I was going to say, it depends how they approach it, right? If they send you a whole thing, you're like, okay, all right. <laughs> well, something I've seen, um, I talked with um, Jeremy over at Sharpest Minds, and he said, you know, they're, they're, they're telling people to just like send GIFs of their project in the LinkedIn chat, right? Okay. And I mean, that that is a cool, unique touch of visualization where wow. you're telling the whole story without them having to click away. Right. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like, well, you know, someone can show me a whole sports analytics project in like four or five seconds. 
Well, right? yeah, that's that's tough, but that's right. that would be cool if they can. Well, if they could do that, I mean, isn't that really compelling for me to say, hey, I, I want to talk with this person more? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And so, you know, it, it's it's all about, OK, how can I um, show that I've been working? How can I like not be asking for too much? How can I make like a friendly introduction? And how can I convey value to them or, or, or to their network very easily? So, um, you know, if I wanted to get more into the sports analytics job specifically, I would say just do your projects on sports, share them. There, there's such active communities on Twitter and on Reddit, like put your work out there. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's so many cool things, um, especially in sports that can go viral. And if you go viral, you're probably going to at least land some sort of blog writing job or, or something like that at the very least. And that leads into something greater and you know, potentially working for a team, whatever that might be. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a couple of questions here that touch on that topic. So Yash is asking, what does a sports analyst they look like? What kind of work do you do? And then his follow up question was, what kind of projects should I work on if I wanted to break into sports analytics? Could you give some examples? Yeah, so I should probably explain what sports analytics is to begin with. Oh, did we so, not do that? Let's do that. <laughs> so uh, my the type of work that I do in sports analytics is only one of the three main branches. So the branch that I'm in is, you know, team performance, team optimization, helping players and the coaches make better decisions. Okay. Related to that is within the organization, helping the organization maximize money. So that's like optimizing ticket prices or, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at fan traffic or what restaurants they should have in the stadiums, whatever that might be. So mm -hmm. there's one branch. The other branch is on the media and news and commercial side. And that's more of a storytelling aspect. You want people to be really engaged with the broadcast, with the journalism associated with it. So you start using uh, data science, data analytics to tell a story. So if you're watching a football game, they'll say, you know, how many sacks a player has, or, um, you, know, you know, you have normal, passing yards, uh, rushing yards, whatever that might be. I'm but understanding all, all of this, by the way, Ken. I'm totally <laughs> following all the sports lingo. You're, you're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> uh, but so, you know, they're starting to inter introduce a lot more advanced stats, too, that help play that help someone sitting on their couch understand and appreciate the game a little bit more. And then the last main branch of sports analytics is in the gambling space. We're trying to predict outcomes. And that's mm. also becoming more and more popular with sports gambling being legalized uh, federally across the US. So I think that that's going to be a big area of growth. So if you're thinking about projects and trying to get into uh, into the field, I would focus on one of those three types of things based on what sector you're interested in getting involved in. Honestly, a lot of them are complementary. If you worked on a project associated with uh, you know, visualizations and understanding the game and telling a good story, that would help you in you know, either of the other two branches of team performance or, or, or the gambling side. But mm -hmm. that would be how I would go about framing the projects that are out there. And from there, I would just focus on things that, that you find interesting, right? People are going to be so much more involved in their own projects that they're doing if they're really passionate about it. For me, it was always golf. Uh, I played a lot of daily fantasy sports and I was trying to predict the golf tournament outcomes. That was my holy grail for quite some time. How now, did you do? Were you good at it? Or did you like I, I, I was net positive, but by the time that I was really diving into it, I wasn't really allowed to do it anymore. Uh -huh. So with some of the contracts we have uh, and the data that we have access to, it's kind of a gray area around if mm. it, it's, it's, it's legal. Great but talk when you're at a corporation. I, highly, highly frowned upon. Uh, so yeah. I, I figured that I'll probably make more money as a data scientist than I do as a sports gambler anyway. So, <laughs> But yeah, that's um, speaking of data, right? There's a question here about, can you share some of the sources for data sets related to sports? Like where would people go to look yes. for data? So Kaggle also has great data. I have a website that I have not really been active on. Uh, it's called playingnumbers.com. Okay. And uh, I have a tab where I just went on Kaggle basically and took all of the sports data sets and just linked them there. So you, you could uh, have more organization and be simpler to use. Mm -hmm. There's also a couple APIs. So one of the more common ones is for R and it's called NFL Scrape R. Um, 
and that, that one's very well documented, very well used. Yeah. Um, golf is hard. Uh, uh, basketball, there are some APIs as well, but they're a little shaky. Uh, but you can get stuff off basketball reference. You can scrape that site relatively easy. Uh, football reference, baseball reference. Um, that's generally what I recommend. Yeah, I think people can also maybe try Google Dataset Search. I'm actually mm -hmm. talking to the founder of Google Dataset Search um, October 13th. So that's going to be an interesting discussion, but I can't go without plugging that, right? It's uh, such a relevant I'll be sure topic. to tune in. Uh, what about cricket? So Adrian says sports analytics has transformed cricket. We almost get as many stats as you might get per baseball game. So in the US, we don't play much cricket, so I don't have much exposure to it. But I would love if there is a cricket analytics expert or someone who is pretty well versed in it to come on to, to my channel and do a talk. Because, uh, you, you know, my biggest thing is if I don't know something, I'm going to try and find someone who does. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to claim to know it all. So I, I would love to have someone talk about that uh, and, and verse me on that because, I mean, I'm obviously interested in how this is applied in across all different sports, whether that's cricket, whether that's like UFC fighting or boxing, uh, golf, basketball, baseball, even swimming. I don't know. What about Either. running? I actually I spent last year analyzing a lot of my running data. That was a lot of yeah, fun. Absolutely. I mean, we have uh, I forget what the guy's name is who who broke the uh, the marathon record. Yes, and that I, guy. I, I know I, that. Guy. I saw a pretty crazy analysis they did on the shoes. Okay. Uh, the, the the new the new Nike shoes you're wearing they're they're basically saying that the shoes are cheating. Oh uh, come on! I want to uh, whoever said that put those shoes on and run a marathon. I'd love to see it. I would love to see it. No, I I, I I'm I completely agree. I think it's it's a, a lot more physical than the technology would be, but <laughs> I do think it's interesting that it's like hey we can quantify some of this stuff. How much faster can an equipment change help me to to perform? You know if you're talking about cycling. Uh, how much does the, the, I don't really know much about cycling, but you know, the, the weight of the bike, I mean, is lighter oh, yeah. really better for building momentum, whatever that might be. So, um, there, there's tons of opportunities. There's a lot, a lot of stuff out there that hasn't been explored yet. And it's fun. I mean, these projects are interesting, at least to me. So that's why I got excited about this, got into this in the first place. Yeah. We've got, we got some help here from Adam. So it was a two hour marathon, Iliud Kipchoge. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, let's see. We've got a question here from Michael. Oh, I think he had a, another question before this because this is a follow on. Okay, so he's late to the party and he apologizes that this was covered. But as someone who has been in the business of uh, data analysis for years, what aspects about sports analysis are fundamentally different? And what would you suggest would be a good skills knowledge to gain in preparation for breaking into this industry? So I think the biggest difference is just the subject area. So mm -hmm. sports have a lot of context. There's a, a lot of subject area expertise that you have to understand. Yeah. And that's for better or for worse, really part of the equation. I mean, we probably would have not gotten our work in golf if uh, my team, you know, we're all really good at golf. I played in college. I used to play professionally. It's, it's something that we understand the competitive aspects of the game probably better than any other um, you know, sports analyst out there just from having played at a, a somewhat high level. I mean, not high level compared to our clients, but yeah. um, the other thing is that there is a formulaic approach to uh, sports analytics. There are actual formulas that have been tested that that um, are, I wouldn't set, say set in stone, but they're used fairly frequently. An example would be the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. So basically a function of the runs that a team has scored versus the runs that have been scored against you can pretty accurately approximate a, a winning percentage based on those numbers, right? And that's used in a lot of things. Let's say I wanted to see how much, uh, what their win percentage would be next year. I can project how many runs I would expect them to score based on any trades or based on their schedule difficulty and the same thing with the ones scored against them. So there are a couple of formulas you want to learn, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, you know, again, baseball wins above replacement, uh, you know, basketball, we have player PER, we have a win share. Uh, there's a bunch of these just approaches that people have used. Uh, and so my best recommendation for getting at least some familiarity with those is a book called Mathletics. That's one of my favorite intro to sports analytics books. 
and they it's in Excel. So I've been trying to talk to the author and see if he'll let me kind of do it all over in, in Python and we can collaborate, but work in progress. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but that is a really great foundation applied with the data science knowledge. And if you're reading blogs, you're looking at some of these other websites that are doing this analysis. Um, like nylon calculus is a good one for basketball. Mm. Uh, that to me is how you develop that that subject area expertise that's so important there. Awesome. And I see um, Stephen has put in a lot of effort getting every type of um, sports emoji in here. So oh, I just had to show it up on screen. There are yeah. a lot of different sports emojis. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephen. So yeah, there's, there's no golf ball, though. What the heck? Oh, no. You didn't see the golf? Hold on. Yeah, that's how you were getting so close the first to one's it. Field I think hockey. the first one is golf, no? That's, that's that definitely hockey? field hockey. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Only, All right, Stephen, come on. We need a golf ball. But anyways, um, a follow-on question from Michael that I really liked was, what would you suggest is the best route for getting an opportunity? Networking, networking, networking. Or are there clear alternative routes that have been shown to be successful? I know we covered this uh, a bit already, but maybe do a little refresher. Of how do people actually get a job? Yeah, so the most effective way, in my opinion, is networking combined with incredible projects or very interesting projects and sharing them. So realistically in sports, you still have to do a somewhat traditional resume drop. It's harder to meet people in sports organizations because there are less sports organizations than there are just normal companies, right? I mean, there's a limited, a finite number of sports teams in the US. You know, we're talking, let's say on average 30 teams per league, you know, we're talking we got uh, 150, 200 total companies, which isn't a very big set. And sports organizations don't have, surprisingly, very large analytics departments even still. So, yeah, right, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe soon. Yeah, and so the amount of people that you could potentially meet in that space are relatively small. Mm -hmm. But you can catch their attention by creating a really cool project, creating a new insight related to the sport and posting it online. Mm -hmm. And if you have a good insight, it's a there's a very good chance that someone will reach out to you and want to share that. Uh, I have a couple a couple friends. Nick Nick Wan, um, he he worked as a data scientist for the Cincinnati Reds for a little bit, and he one of the main ways that he got his job is that he wrote a blog. He had a really cool analysis that he did that ended up getting posted in the newspaper, mm -hmm. and he was able to leverage that into a position. That's an incredible story to tell. Is that hey, this is the work that I've done. Um, and if you say you're in the newspaper, you send the article, that's something that, that can turn heads pretty easily. So obviously that won't always happen. You're not going to get picked up by a major news source. But at right. the same time, you can definitely increase your chances that you at least get recognized or noticed by putting that stuff out in the world. And yeah, thank you. I know you also have a, a course. I'm actually, I was looking it up to get the exact name on uh, Udemy of how to start a career in data science 2020. I noticed you have 999 students right now. Maybe you'll break the thousand mark on uh, on our on our LinkedIn Live. But why don't you tell people a little bit about that course? Because a lot of questions that are coming in are around how do I get you know a career in data science, and I think it's just a great place to to talk about this. Yeah. So in the course, I talk about a lot of the things that I've talked about here in just a little bit more depth. So I start with how to build a project portfolio. So that's going on Kaggle, going on GitHub, which types of projects you should do. Um, also how to go about presenting them. The readme is very important. If I'm an employer, I'm, I almost care more about how you document your process than what the actual project is. I mean, the project has to be interesting and unique, but right. you know, I, I need you to be working with my software engineers, my other data scientists, your code needs to be scalable. That's something I care about. So yeah. it's, it's some intricacy around what that looks like. Also how to build a resume, uh, how to network, how to go through each stage of the interview process and put your best foot forward. I have a bunch of templates. I have a bunch of other extra materials about um, you know, some of the mindset, how to tell a really good story, how to do your, your two minute elevator pitch about yourself. Uh, and I would hope that anyone going through and, and getting that is is really finding a lot of value in, in really cracking that process. I can't guarantee that anyone will get a job from, from taking a course. It's all about what you put in. But yeah. I would hope that this goes a lot more into 
some of the soft skills and the things that you don't necessarily think about when applying for a job uh, that really makes the most difference, just like the referral stuff we've been talking about. Uh, yeah. I also have quite a few interviews with uh, data scientists, data science hiring managers, where they talk about the things that, that they find important, what they look for in candidates. So uh, I, I do a ton of that on my YouTube channel as well. Um, my, my thought is that, you know, that can either complement on my channel, you know, you can get almost all that information on my YouTube as well. Not all of it, though. Um, Not all of it. No, you got to get the course. Not all of it. <laughs> can't but, uh, stuff for the course. <laughs> yeah, I saved a little bit, you know. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully that's a really good resource for getting you to that next level. Um, it also has a little bit to do with the psychology of it because uh, it's hard to get a data science job. It, it is not, it, you know, there's, there's the way I look at it is you have, uh, you know, 50, 100, 200 people applying for the same job. You're all competing. I mean, you make six figures as a data set. You're competing for an over a hundred thousand dollar prize. These yeah. other people are going to be working pretty hard. But if you're thinking about it that way, it's like, what would I do for a couple hundred thousand dollars? I'd work pretty hard for that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, how do you frame it so that you're willing to put in the effort, you're willing to do the right things to be able to reach that that uh, intermediary goal? Because there's no end goal. Like data science in and of itself, there is no end. You're always learning, you're always adapting, you're always changing. It's nice to get one of those wins, which is getting a job, but yeah. hopefully it extends a lot further than that. You're continuing to learn and you're getting it because you love it, not because you just want a certain amount of money or whatever that might be. Yeah, absolutely. And I shared um, the link to your course in the comments if people want oh, thank to you. check that out. And look, Stephen pulled through. He got you three golf emojis. I love it. Thank you, Stephen. Good looking um, out. Yes. Let's see. Uh, Bhavan's question. What chances do international students stand in getting a data science job in the sports industry considering sponsorship concerns? I, I honestly haven't gotten that question before and I wouldn't want to give you a wrong answer. I'll look into that on reach out to me. I'll, I'll try and I'll ask some people and see what the sponsorship is like across some of the organizations. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working in media, so data science and media, which is again, one of these branches, yeah. there are a lot of conglomerates, CBS, NBC, whatever that might be uh, that have sponsorships. So I would imagine that the opportunities related to that branch would probably be a lot better. Um, you know, these sports teams as, as large as they might be, I don't think that they do as much international hiring as quite a few other companies. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that the, the media approach or that branch of it would be the best bet. Got it. We have a very pessimistic view from Rodolfo who says 1 trillion. So thanks Rodolfo. Don't discourage people. <laughs> um, and Adam's been sharing uh, various links. I think this is a link to your YouTube channel. Thanks, so, yes. Thanks Adam. That's always helpful. I wanted to scroll up. Um, let's see if I find that question, but there was a really good question about the 66 days of data. I probably won't find the exact question. What? Uh, no, it's not there. But anyways, the question was around, do, do, does the 66 days of data also cover soft skills? Because that's an area that's commonly missed and people focus on you know, Python, programming, algorithms. But what about the soft skills? So it doesn't explicitly uh, cover that. I think that soft skills are, so the 66 days of data, I've looked at it mainly as an initiative to learn the technical skills. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking to get a, a job in data science, you can absolutely use the 66 days of data for that use case. I would say that if you were to do that, my course would probably make sense uh, to combine with the 66 days of data uh, mm -hmm. because I do cover a lot of the soft skills. I mean, one of the most important things to me, which I think will probably resonate very well with you, Kate, is the storytelling aspect, being able to tell your own story and for even your resume to be able to tell a story of how you got to that interview with them right now. Does everything mm -hmm. that I've done to this point lead up to me? You know, does it make sense that I'm sitting across the table from you? And is the next logical step on your resume or through our conversation to give you this job, right? I mean, yeah. if, if you can tell a, a good story, that's a definite uh, possibility, a definite reality. So um, I am hoping to do a little bit more of the soft skills conversation on my YouTube channel. I, you know, I've done, but I have talked about it quite a bit in some of the interviews. I think mm -hmm. in our interview, we talk about it as well. So 
Uh, again, I think it's going to come out in either two or three weeks. I will make it's sure. Soon, everybody, it's coming yeah, so, out. So get excited. Get excited. Yes, get excited. <laughs> Um, question here, I love this from Al. So where do you see gaps in the sports analytics space? So obviously baseball seems saturated, football, I assume as well. Are there any significant market opportunities that you're seeing? Yeah, so I think that with sports gambling, there's going to be a lot of things opening up. Okay. We're going to be looking at people being able to place bets on every shot and every minute of the games in almost real time. And so there's an opportunity, I think, for arbitrage on the gambling side. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the house will generally net win. There's also a lot of opportunities in data collection and also in stun understanding the psychology of performance. There aren't as uh, many resources out there for understanding the non-physical aspects of the game right now. Mm -hmm. And there's also, uh, you know, with the players' unions and stuff, it's really hard to get uh, to get like bio data to get people to have a wearable. I mean, maybe oh. it's a little easier with being in the bubble and, you know, like health concerns, but access to that data is going to be really dicey. I would love to see in the future athletes being willing to share a bit more um, mm -hmm. because right now they're really scared that that data is going to be used against them. Mm -hmm. uh, like always oh, not putting in the works, not putting in the time, whatever that might be. So I, I would hope that we can do a lot with that bio data to make sports safer. So you're yeah. looking at football with some of the CTE stuff. It's very scary. I'm sure data can help with that, help us make better uh, decisions around that. And it already has begun to, to a certain extent. Um, but on the performance side, we can also figure out when we should be taking players in and out, how to give them optimal rests to rest so that there's less injuries. Um, you know, how do we uh, give them the exact amount of stress during practice so that they're optimizing their performance rather than overworking or underworking them. So there's a lot of really cool opportunities there, um, but that's more on the data collection side. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are great data collection systems, but they're a little bit one-dimensional right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting with the, the bio data. I mean, if people are going to be willing to do that, and I know a lot of people in public just in general have started wearing all these things. I can't do it. I just feel yeah, like- I do this one, all my sleep tracking and um, exercise. So that was a ring or something. It so is. That's it's called it's the aura ring. They have a, it's like some I've never seen there. this, okay. That, all, all the NBA players are wearing them now for, for the for the bubble. That's like, so that's the big one. And then I think golfers are wearing this thing called the whoop. Okay. Uh, and I think football players are also doing the whoop. I can't remember exactly, but the, those the do well. So it's a it's like a band. It looks like a Fitbit, but it tracks all your sleep and activity data as well. Okay, that's interesting. Do you have to charge the ring? I'm assuming you do, right? Yeah, every three or four days, but it only takes 15, 20 minutes to charge. So okay. I, I really liked it. I, I read this book called Why We Sleep, and it talks okay. about the importance of sleep and how uh, basically the thesis is if there was a drug that could give you more energy, that could reduce your, you know, help you lose weight, reduce your risk of cancer, reduce the risk of depression, anxiety. Uh, how much would you pay for it? Mm. And then the guy's like, you know, sleep gives you all these benefits and it's free. So if you slept more, you know, you, whatever it would be. But uh, but that really freaked me out, and so I started tracking my sleep uh, a lot yeah. more, more, more careful about it and having better sleep hygiene. So I just but, sleep. I don't track it. I just I don't waste time in my sleep time well, tracking my sleep. If you sleep well, then there's no need to track it. Actually, yesterday I was up for two hours in the middle of the night because my daughter woke up and then I just could not fall back asleep and still had to wake up at five. And that's why I'm kind of like, you know, not as energetic as usual, but um, we got some comments here. So Steven says wearable devices for all sports that could be interesting. And Al says, great gosh, um, Ken, he's got two boys heading off to play college baseball. Injuries are a huge concern, so he didn't consider that. Thank you all. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I might be biased now, but I recommend sleep. Make sure your <laughs> kids are getting enough sleep. I know when I was heading off to college and playing golf there, I was not getting enough sleep, and that probably hurt my performance. Probably. Sleep is the most important thing. And I food. I know you're hungry, Ken because you told me that before we started. So on that note, I'm actually going to start wrapping things up. And Ken, I want to thank you for 
first of all, teaching me a lot about sports analytics. I, I didn't really have much of a background. Um, you could probably tell when my eyes glaze over when you go into the little the lingo that I'm like, passes, forwards, yeah, okay, great. People are throwing balls back and forth. That's how I can picture. But I definitely learned a lot. And I think the the stuff we talked about today is transferable to any industry, right? Pick, yeah, pick a topic in that industry, pick the data in that industry, put together your portfolio, get Ken's course, go on Ken's YouTube channel. And um, I wanted to ask, the last question I always ask at the end of my sessions is where can people go to continue the conversation if they had more questions? Yeah, so the best place to reach me or the best place to learn more is my YouTube channel. Again, that's just, you type my name, Kenji, into YouTube, mm -hmm. and I should be the first to come up. I have a lot more content, a lot more videos about sports analytics, uh, a lot about data science, how to break in those things. I do my best to answer every comment, and that is where I am most likely to respond. I have I do everything in batches on LinkedIn and in my email, so I probably won't respond in a, a reasonable amount of time there, but YouTube is by far the best place. I am still available on LinkedIn. I, I would imagine that because this is through LinkedIn, uh, I'm pretty easy to find there. Yeah. Uh, Twitter is also Ken G underscore DS. And then I've written a couple articles on Medium as well. Just uh, I think that's somehow related to my name. If you type in Ken G Medium, uh, I'll be pretty easy to find there. And then, of course, the course that you'd mentioned uh, on Udemy, how to start a career in data science in 2020. So I love hearing from any new people, also people who have been with me for a long time. Uh, doing my best to help navigate this space. And I'm having a blast talking about it, hearing about it, and hearing about your journeys. So definitely don't be a stranger, anyone who's come in and uh, participated today. Awesome. Well, I think your your passion for the for data science and sports analytics definitely comes through. So thank you again for being on the show. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me.